Hey there, it is Amy Bailey. And Clive Standen. And you are joining us on Vicast. It's a Viking thing. And as the King of Wessex and King of Brett Walder, all of England, I order you to listen to Vicast. It's a Viking thing. If you and I join together, not only against the Northmen, but also against Mercia. Welcome, Princess. We should surely overcome it. Do you think you're a good man? Yes, I think so. Are you corrupt? Oh, yes. You and I. Are you? Mm Mm-hmm. Can I ask you, just going back to you, I I won't ask who this person was that you had in mind with Eckbert, but... I, I, Eckbert, actually, full disclosure, is my absolute favorite character, and if there was anyone I could play on the show, it would be Eckbert. Um, did you, I feel like people were torn whether he was a hero or a villain, mm. uh, which which I think is the most flawless villain, really. He's unpredictable, that's what makes him so scary and mercurial. And did you consider this person that you... Uh, modeled him after do you consider him a villain or a bad person i mean it's that question that ragnar asked you are, are you well, asked, exactly you asked each other are you a good person or a bad person exactly. what is your answer to that as lioness oh you, you're asking me if i'm a good person or am i a bad person amy <laughs> no no i'm asking if linus thinks yeah well <laughs> yeah, i'd like to know that does linus think Eckbert is a good or a bad person well you, you know you just i know where your question sort of puts it perfectly as how can we say you know he did some very bad things and he did some of them for some very bad reasons and some of them he you know he was a futurist he was an empire builder he wanted change and i think sometimes the people that see the future wreck you know cause a lot of damage along the way but they do create the future as well so when you look back you go okay it was destructive was it really they actually created something new and they they saw ahead and but yes, I mean, look, he, he had a massive ego, so let's not beat about the bush. And that's part of what you had to sort of grab hold of in the character and the role. And and uh, I think, you know, he wouldn't have stayed in power or done done what he did, becoming Brett Walder, king of all England. He is technically, in fact, in one book I found, he is technically the first king of England. Wow. Mm. What I liked about what Michael had done and what we sort of built within it, and the fact that, you know, that scene with Travis where we say, are you a good man? That this wasn't just done as this pure Machiavelle. No, it's too con- it's much more complicated than that. He was a human being and there was great suffering and sacrifice and a lot actually, he paid a price for what he did, which is what is also fantastic to do as an actor. Yeah. Mm. As you know, to take a role on this massive journey, this massive arc and, age over all those years and then have the weight of the conscience of the soul bearing down on you i mean yeah that was so yeah. epic to do Juicy. i was just so grateful <laughs> but, but he but he must know that what he's doing from the start right because that's what i find fascinating about your character is that on the surface he's friendly he's understanding he's yeah he's he he's he's for the country for the people but very quickly and the audience turns out he's complete obviously he's selfish he's unscrupulous you know he's he's a hypocrite i mean there's that amazing episode where he goes and he's outraged by the fact that you know that uh athelwolf would go and attack the viking settlement and things and and yeah he's organized the whole thing he's screaming at his court yeah, and everything yeah. and he's yeah and that's that was the fun of it well but, actually but, clive that it's interesting that scene you're talking about that's when we got to really reveal so much yeah about him yeah that was that that was actually because there was there was always like oh he's this complex character oh he's got dark motives and oh he's a machiavelli and a manipulator and he'll just do it and it's all that all very interesting but when that happened in the show because the vikings are the heroes of this show that was the ultimate betrayal of lagatha of ragnar of everything and that just showed his real colors and that became if you like the point from which we reference back when we got to, you know, my own death and the King Egbert's demise was like, that was actually bearing down on his conscience too. He'd done too many bad things. So it, it's beautiful that you can actually, I don't know how Michael manages to hold all these characters in his head and carry all their journeys and be true to them. I really, do, I actually, I really don't. I think uh, yeah. Somebody should do a study on well, his brain. We'll do a, because we'll do a podcast. We will. That's going to be our main you question. You definitely should because there's something, there's something, yeah, how did he do that? 
that's almost i don't know anybody who's ever done that i mean i've known showrunners have a lot of control but to literally write every episode and be tracking yeah. all of that yeah. the integrity yeah. of, i mean look he he was cool as you guys know that he would allow us to come in with input and you know insight and occasionally just check something and say well this doesn't feel quite right and the fact that he could respond to all of that at the same time was mm -hmm. wonderful because he was trusting us but really to shape that many hours of tv and those mm -hmm. that many characters mm -hmm. and keep it true and on track i i think it's a feat unlike anything i've ever seen before it shows his passion as well though yeah. you've got to be so passionate about a subject to want yeah. to invest that yeah. much into it as well i got another one for you do you think oh. egbert is lonely because I think about him and I think, I mean, he even says to his own son, Athelwolf, he says, I don't have any true friends. I think, I'm not sure if that's the exact line, but they have a conversation about, I have no real true friends. And, but he kind of, um, he kind of almost mm -hmm. betrays everybody close to him as well. So are they disposable? Are they all disposable? I mean, look, he, he, he's willing to sacrifice Athelwolf, his own son in battle. Mm -hmm. He betrays Quentrith really badly um who else i mean lagatha he becomes friends with lagatha and then you know and then betrays her over the settlement takes everything from her um he betrays ragnar but ultimately i mean is everyone i mean is there anyone else i mean magnus every, everyone close to him he kind of betrays but so he's kind of it's almost out of his own doing well listen i mean we can say it now the man's not in office anymore but do you think donald trump really loves anybody i mean you know it's the he is a nurse right i mean king egbert is the archetypal narcissist i think he's in love with himself and lagatha says that to him the only person you actually love is yourself and he kind of just smiles and goes he knows it's true <laughs> so <laughs> but, but what about what about athelstan i mean did he just see him as well, a saint no, that, or was that, he tr truly that was something he was sort of almost like um ineffable something that neither ragnar nor he could get their hands around there was something actually genuinely authentic and pure and holy, holy that that yeah. that neither of them yeah. had that they basically saw in him and wanted and wanted to have it it was almost almost like a homoerotic thing going on there as well it was so it was very layered mm -hmm. all of that and then it became this competitive thing about he loved me more you know he loved, you know and so i think athelstan became that touchstone of something genuine and pure but was he maybe was could he maybe have been the son that Egbert never had? I definitely. mean, he doesn't seem to be very fond of it at all. He has far more in definitely, common. Definitely, yeah. He didn't didn't respect his own son at all. You know, he saw something pure in this man. He was just like an opportunist. He wanted so much for himself. I don't think he was very capable of love. Um, you know, but I think with Judith there was a sweet thing at the end. I think he sort of has his King Lear moment at the end. Michael and I talked about this when we get to work. He's sort of losing it. He's handed over the crown. He's done the right thing, but he's actually played a trick on the Vikings, which is another cool little ploy that he's done because he's not really the king to give away the land that he gives them. And yeah. But there was this moment when they were leaving and he goes to his grandson to Alfred and he wishes them well, gives them advice, and he's and Judith thanks him for loving her because he did he gave her an opportunity he was i think sometimes with these people when they're narcissists and self-involved like this you forget that they also can have a positive effect on people and do extraordinary things because they think outside of the box so right. again it's too, it's too complicated to say oh he's a narcissist therefore you just you know he's an evil bastard not true uh he did a lot of very you know he was he was looking at the romans going god these guys are so ahead of everybody you know what can we learn from them he was always he was a, a student of life and and of the past but applying it to now and to the future and uh i think i think that's a fascinating aspect for any human being and it's a wonderful thing to get to play but it's no good unless you've actually got the words that are written for you to do it and uh you know, a scope of a story to portray it. But I felt very lucky that uh, I was given that scope and I was given scenes that would, and that's Michael, that's Michael. I thank Michael for it, really. You know, as we, we owed everything to him, the words that came out of our mouths, you know. But, you know, Travis, as you guys know, he, Travis gave so much to this show. He, the way he was the leader in, in many ways, he was the man and his ability to, 
bring things to scenes and bring ideas to the show and up the stakes all the time. That really helped me because I came in like ready to sort of meet him. I had no idea that our journeys would end up coming full circle right back. We didn't know that when we started, but it kind of made sense when it happened. But getting to work with him and getting these sort of moral issues out and getting them explored in front of the camera, it was like some of that stuff was his idea. You know, it came out of his head and he would he would suggest it. And then we talked to Michael again. That's Michael would, you know, be very generous and go, That's a great idea, better than mine. Let's use that. And and then sometimes I would I'd be the one going to the director saying, Do you know what? If we shot this a little bit like this way, this could help get bring this moment. And and, th- and then it became real collaboration, like I've actually never had before. Yeah, and me since. too. I was curious because I certainly remember uh, my first meeting you. Um, I felt so delighted that you were actually the first character that I had most of my interaction with. And I was curious when, how much, I don't know how much Rolo and Eckbert crossed over as characters. And then do you remember uh meeting each other for the first time but what what interaction did you guys have as characters well my character if i remember rightly the the the, the only real i mean we obviously uh supped with king Edward, but the big storyline where rollo was involved because without rollo i don't think any deal would have been done with with Eckbert and ragnar because if you remember it was that incredible battle where Eckbert um outplays the vikings whereas where rollo's run over by the horses and left for dead and egbert yeah uses rollo the brother as a kind of well if you want your brother back he's still alive and and we can do a deal and i can give you a settlement and you have to defend mercia against the you know the overpowering uncle right yeah so we didn't really have any face-to-face time but um, no. the storylines the character i story just remember meeting you in a bar in ireland that's all i remember <laughs> Did you? Yeah. So before you started <laughs> a few, filming, a few Guinnesses. Excellent. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, and, they, and we'd met. Yeah, it was some gig or somewhere in Dublin, as we all did, spend many hours. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah, we went to a we went to a, 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 a oh, gig. Yeah, yeah a music uh, gig in the that. center of town. Was it? Uh, yeah. There were a lot of us there, and they were. I can't remember who was it. A local Irish band, and we were all we were all sort of getting to know each other still and newbies. Yeah. 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 But our, I mean, our first meeting, Amy, was kind of, I mean, we had, I think we had the dinner scene first, but then we had that crazy scene, which was <laughs> this know. hysterical scene. We'd hardly even met, you know, and there we were like rehearsing this kind of crazy love scene for one of a better word, intimate scene, I suppose it's called nowadays. But it was so, so well written. It was so funny, the whole thing that yeah. Edward was exhausted and couldn't, couldn't. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, so, that... And he lines up the warriors yeah, that, to come that, in. That, that was my audition scene. <laughs> And really? uh, in the audi- yes, and in the audition, she invites a guard in after Eckbert leaves. And by the time we got on set, I invited three in, which I don't understand the logistics of that. But I do remember, because you and I did film, my very first scene on Vikings that I filmed was the banquet scene, which was really fun. We had the amazing Carrie Skogland, um, who let us sort of play it out in a, in a, a theater-esque way we played the entire scene which never happens in tv it was so delightful but my very first meeting you was i'm in my dressing room amy we come down meet linus roach who's playing Eckbert. go down on the set we shake hands and then within about 10 seconds i was climbing on top of you and we were discussing because <laughs> we were mapping out the sex scene and we were discussing That's right. uh censorship because in i guess in america you can do a maximum of three That's thrusts right. <laughs> before it censored. <laughs> That's true, so right? you and I were working out the choreography as well yeah. in our last interview, Clive was talking about stunt choreography. So I guess with Quenforth, I have sex choreography. Yeah. But um, yeah, so we were sort of on each other. And I and I uh, said to my husband, I was like, I- I'm so lucky. What a nice guy this Linus is that I'm going to have to <laughs> do funny. all these things with. <laughs> well, I think, day, I think that was the closest that was the closest thing to a stunt that I did, Amy, because uh, I'm like, you know, all the Vikings were out there in the mud, you know, you guys had all the battles and I just sat on my throne or, you know, had to deal with that. Same, <laughs> same. Well, you, you had all you had all your scenes. Well, a lot of your, I was really jealous of you, especially after those big battle scenes. Is Every time I ever read you in the script or saw you on TV, you were in those in the, beautiful Roman yeah, thermal the bath. baths. And I never got a bath scene. <laughs> Travis, Travis got did. A bath scene. Yeah, and of I course, you had. 
I remember Travis was saying, because I think they only gave Travis that scene because they really wanted to get his Calvin Klein six pack out, which he was refusing to Poor do. Anytime Travis. that they could, to, they could try and get him naked, they would. And I remember Travis called them at the, their own game and they were like, so Travis, this scene, um, you've been on a boat for many, many days and the salt water has been blasting you and you're sweating, you've been sleeping in your clothes. Wouldn't it be great just to take all your clothes uh. off and just bathe and be clean? And he went, he went, yeah, I understand the, th the thought process, um, but uh, my clothes would be dirty too. So wouldn't it be better if I just jumped in and cleaned my body and my clothes and then I've got clean clothes to go home with? Yeah. <laughs> it's like he just had an answer for everything. Yeah. No, I think they gave him that scene so he could do the fart in the bath trick. That's all. He <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's the amazingness of looking back and watching these scenes and how sort of, how, you know, everything is so... so quite intense and then and only we know what the behind the scenes was of yes travis probably was farting in the bath in between takes how long did you spend in those baths i mean were they they, they were kind of clean and yeah, real they were and, clean and you know, warm and, and, and pretty nice great. you know yeah i mean it was it was good stuff i mean what's better go to ireland play a king sit in the roman bath and uh, go home <laughs> uh, you know it's like no it was it was really nice and and the fact that um you know Egbert's demise, his final scene, his death played out in the bath but again was, you know, obviously it, it seemed like an obvious thing, but at the time we didn't know how Egbert was going to die and what, what the end was going to be. But the fact that it did come full circle and it was that that was my last shot in the bath. Linus, you did all your best acting in the bath. I actually find in life, Clive, I do all my best acting in the bath. <laughs> it's, uh, isn't it true for all of us? We're just great in the bath, in the shower. I got yeah. I got to get in the expert bath uh, with Jenny Jacks, who played Judith, um, and we had a lovely scene in there, and, and it was even extra lovely because I happened to be about six months pregnant with my twins, so getting yeah. in water in any way was the best. Was yeah. Great. Well, I remember, Amy, we had to hide your bump, didn't we? And, you know, in one of those, uh, when was it? The, the death scene, wasn't it? We in my hide... death scene. Yeah, we're trying to hide the bump. <laughs> <laughs> because I was, Jenny came and she stabbed me from behind. That's right. And I was, I was falling backwards onto the bed and doing this Oscar winning death. And then the, uh, they kept saying, cut, we can't see your face. All we can see is your belly. So you're yeah. going to have to die sideways so we can actually see what's going on. <laughs> yeah, I know. Crazy. I Crazy. loved, I loved that. But the baths were important. I brought the baths up. It's because that was uh, you. You had like a whole villa built for you, didn't you? They, they it wasn't just all in the set. They had this beautiful kind of um, well, villa it, setup. It was really interesting because, like you were saying at the beginning, Michael's first sort of uh, touchstone was Charlemagne, and it was the influence of Charlemagne and everything, you know, Frankia that he would have you know known about, and he would have had a different perspective simply because he spent those years in Charlemagne's court. In fact, I think in in truth, he married somebody from Charlemagne's court and brought them back. Uh, he'd actually, the, the Wessex throne had been taken by someone else and he he should have had it and he had to go away and wait basically <laughs> until he could get it back and then he got it back. But then as Michael did, you know, he would he would change tack. And so the fact that the, the Roman villa was there, obviously there was this idea that the Romans had an influence, but then he started to really build on it. And he started to really get interested in what would Egbert, he'd be fascinated by the Romans. He'd be fascinated by Caesar and this whole idea of that, that room full of scrolls of war tactics, of, you know, that um, he got Athelstan to translate it all. That was, that came a little bit later, that idea. But so these two very strong, one from the past, well, both from the past, but one from the, you know, quite far back. And because at that point in England, a lot of people had lost touch with history and didn't know who the Romans were. They, they actually had these stories that giants once had ruled the land and built these great big monoliths and roads and all this stuff. They didn't, they'd lost touch with the fact that what the, what the Romans done for us. And also after the Romans, there was a period of time where we, the Christianity was lost. Everything was lost, wasn't it? I mean, it was uh, the Holy Father Gregory who was in Rome and he saw, I think the story is he saw some very pale skinned slaves in, in, in the marketplace in Rome. And he said, who are they? And they said, they're, they're Angles or Angelos. And he said, no, they're angels. And he sent over St. Augustine to go over and to kind of bring everything back, bring the faith back as an apostle. And that's kind of where all the kind of the scriptures came from. So that's kind of where we pick up in where, where 
Egbert is, is this newfound, you know, they've got in, get in touch with their religion again. And that's you know, where the Anglo-Saxons were really kind of came into their own. I think, you know, it, it, just as you say that, it makes me think another strand that Michael really found in the show, which I think keeps it interesting, and it was there from the first episode, is this sense of the, whatever the belief, there's some sort of mysticism or something that's just like, well, what is it? You know, what is that raven? What is the, you know, what is the pagan, you know, to, to get into the pagan belief and bring it to life the way it was really, that's why that Uppsala episode deeply affected me because I actually felt like I understood, like consciously, a culture that would actually think I give my life to go to Valhalla. I And, you know, that's dangerous. It's close to, you know, a lot of things we know in the world today. But it, it, he had the ability to awaken that consciousness around it. So likewise with Christianity and the war with what's right and good and true and God and Athelstan, the fact that Athelstan went back and you're going to have a great conversation with George about this. Yeah. You know? yeah. Am I a Viking or a Christian? Viking, Christian, Viking. Fantastic. <laughs> and that's the first time, doesn't he swell? He sees, he sees like the clouds turn into a dragon. That was the first kind of Christian yeah. kind of a uh, uh, vision because we've, we'd seen Ragnar and the Ravens and Odin. And then you see yeah. Athelstan and he just looks out and he sees the cloud. That's, and just after yeah. that, these sleek ships with dragon heads kind of come out of the mist. And that's when the story really begins up at, um, yeah. at Lindisfarne. Cause I mean, it really was, I mean, I think the Vikings coming forth was in the Christian time of the Anglo-Saxon time at the time there was, you know, there was proph prophecies of like, you know, a great evil from the North would set forth and, and, you know, and, 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 and decimate, you know, the, the inhabitants of the land. It's not, that's not a direct quote, but it's around that. Um, so when they did see these people coming, they really did think it was the end of the world. They thought this was it. These people from the North are coming. So, I mean, it really was, they were terrified. And yet your character is the first person with knowledge comes power. And with all, you know, because in Frankia, they'd already met these Vikings before. Right. So I think you know, you're able to kind of not be afraid of this. They're not otherworldly and you know, monsters can, you know, coming from, from hell. Well, I think that's, again, you know, anybody who's a, I call them a futurist, but somebody who's got a visionary, if you like, you know, they're not closed to the world. They're interested in the world. So the, the other is not something just to be feared. The other is something to be fascinated by and to understand and to know it, you know. And I think, I think Egbert found himself compelled by the Viking strength. And, you know, I think, did he not say one time, I can't remember it so long ago now, but like, if only I had an army like that, you know. And and you guys captured it because that was also you remember that in that Lindus I think it is the Lindus farm um, when you first land there and you've got a bunch of Saxon soldiers and these bunch of Vikings walk down the beach and suddenly you have these two cultures meeting and you just yeah. knew the Saxons don't have a chance you just knew they did not have the same ethos and and mentality no. and commitment and you just knew they're gonna they're gonna lose i thought yeah he was like the really? little sheriff wasn't he he was like i don't know what he would have been but he was just this one little like i'm not sure it's a good idea but, uh, and that's the thing because the vikings yeah. they'd they'd been told stories about was it the the dragon fafnir that uh aslug um always talks about the dragon fafnir would would protect all of his yeah. treasure and not let anyone <laughs> near it and yeah. then they come and they just got these like little monks that have just got all this gold and there's no no one's protecting right. it at all so it's right. like well Party. just go right. and take it it's the survival right. of the fittest linus did you find it hard to shake the character of Eckford after playing it for so long i mean you've you've played long-term characters before uh like in law and order but you know, after so many years with this character, were you were you ready to lay into bed? I I don't actually, you know, I'm not I'm not, I'm not a method actor. It's not about like I'm living as King Edward. What what I what it took a little while to shake, uh, not not too long to be honest, because I think it was such a satisfying arc. Mm. Um, it's such, and the fact that we knew and we talked about that my journey would complete in the same season right. as. Ragnar's and it was meant to be that there was a chance that I could have gone on into the next season but it just actually didn't make sense yeah. and we needed to keep that integrity what I what I what was hard to let go of was the world yeah. you know the people yeah. the 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 time you know Ireland, Ireland uh, yeah. I mean, my second home I had this little house down in Dalkey and I managed to have it but every year I got the same place and it is, I'm still in touch with the landlady there. We write to each other all the time. Oh. And, I'm, you know, uh, 
uh, Philip O'Sullivan, who played yeah. uh, Bishop Edmund. Yeah. You know, he's a local. Oh, man. Yeah. I'm in touch with. Just spoke to him the other day. Uh, and so it, and but it was also just the world. But I think because, as I say, when you've taken a journey and you've gone on that journey and gone all the way through and then come to the end, it's kind of like there's a completion yeah. and there's something natural, and you just walk on and. And to be quite honest, my beard was so damn low <laughs> and my hair was so damn long. It, I, you know, apart from getting a part as one of the ZZ Top guys, I had no future. I had, had to come off. So, you know, it was definitely time and it was sad, but it was the right time. And uh, I just ended up being like enormously grateful. And it's wonderful to do something like this and get you guys. It's a great idea because there's a lot of just very good memories that we all have, you know, about it, of our time and being together. and. And I suppose we, we're all going to be hoping that another time, another place, we can have another experience like that. So, yeah. How much did you know about Vikings before you took on the show? Very little. I mean, real Vikings, no. I knew nothing. I mean, I was, uh, you know, I was a heathen. I basically, as a kid, I had one of those Viking helmets which had the horns on it, which wasn't Whoa. real. You know, they didn't have that. That was a Victorian. No. That was a Victorian was thing. Wagner. <laughs> yeah. Wagner, yeah. Wagner's <laughs> operas. <laughs> so I knew very little, and <clears throat> I found the show. You know, which is, again, Michael's great strength is that he's a, he's a lover of history. He is a historian. But his his ability to dramatize history. And yes, he takes enormous poetic license with things. He's not about being true to everything that happened. It's not about that. But he has the ability to bring history alive now. So you care about it yes. now. And that, to me, is a great gift. It's a great gift. Mm -hmm. It's a great education. I think the show is an education because it shows you... It gives you some historical background, but it gives you a sense of what these people might have been like. And it's very hard, I think, as postmodern people to even, what was it like to be alive yeah. back then? Yeah. Yeah. What was it like? Michael, yeah. Michael always used to say, truth is stranger than fiction. I always like that. Yeah. It's like the history is so much more entertaining than anything you can make up. And that's why he was never, Michael to this day, I mean, maybe he's changed now, but when we were filming, he'd never watched a, a, a episode of Game of Thrones. He'd never read the books. And he wasn't, yeah. it was not nothing, it's not, he was not no. de uh, talking down on anything. Yeah. It was just, he, he was, he's not interested in Lord of the Rings, really. It's, it's, for him, it's about history yeah. and it's about anything that really happened. Yeah. You can, there's so many stories and, and interpretations because there's their truth, their yeah. truth. And then the real truth is in the middle somewhere. And that's yeah. to the, no historian really sees eye to eye. So that's right. No, he wasn't into the fantasy element. He said there's enough there in, in, in real history. And, but he, he, you know, he did like to play little tricks along the way as well. Cause I, I mean, we both are great lovers of um, T.S. Eliot. So he threw a T.S. Eliot poem yeah. into one of the episodes <laughs> and we just changed it enough that you wouldn't know. But, um, but anyway, fantastic. I love great that. to chat about it. Oh, let's uh, before we go. Can we? I'd like. I want to talk to you just about what we said about the charities. We talk. We should. We might as well ask you. Can we? What you've got going on now? If there's anything you're filming or got going, or if you know, the charities, whatever it lines. If there's anything you particularly want to filming right nice now. To... Sure. Yeah. I'm. I'm. I've just started work on a, an Amazon movie called My Policeman, which is a beautiful. It's a love story set in the fifties and the nineties. It's got a great cast: Harry Styles, Emma Corrin from The Crown, and David Dawson, and then. Myself and um, Rupert Everett and Gina McKee are playing the older versions of those characters. Oh, cool. So it's set in these two times. And it's a it's a lovely script. And we've got Michael Grandage directing it. And so I'm really looking forward to go back. They've oh, just brilliant. started filming. I go back in a few weeks' time to start my stuff on that, which is great. And, um, yeah, charity work. I'm a patron of a charity called Yes to Life, which um, basically helps people with a cancer diagnosis it gives them sort of the resources and the information that you can't get on the national health and so if you know of anyone who's struggling or dealing with that you know just awful thing of getting one of those diagnoses and it's very overwhelming because i've had some friends who've had to deal with this this is a great resource it's a great place to go to they can help you they can guide you um they also need your help and support. And I think once you find out who they are, you'll want to give back to them because it's one of those mm. things that hopefully one day everybody will have access to that kind of help. And and the only other thing is, I'm, you know, I became a climate reality leader this year in the lockdown. I trained with Al Gore and the Clim Climate Reality Project. So I'm a trained climate reality leader, and which means I can give presentations. I just care very much about what's happening in the world right now. I know we all do. It's great. 
and uh, you know, I did I did my little bit with XR. I got arrested last year, went to jail. <laughs> that, that I was, but I thought, well, I, I'll try Proper that. Proper Viking. Yeah, and that was kind of interesting uh, event to do. But I feel, in a way, I'm better off doing the education side of it, and I'm getting involved in a few local things to help with the environment as well. But yeah. we've all got to do our bit and do what we can. We have. I was. I was going to ask you, we, we want to ask everyone that comes on the show, what's the most Viking thing they think they've done in their life? If you were, if you were to get to the, to the gates of the, of the halls of Valhalla and Odin just stopped you and said, hang on a minute. What have you done? What's the most Viking thing you've done? <laughs> Why do you think you deserve in there? If there were one thing in your life where you go, yeah, that was pretty Viking. Well, do you know what? I you just got to go with what comes to mind, haven't you? I live in this very remote part in the Hudson Valley, which is very peaceful, and very beautiful, and it's just idyllic. But people on the road have guns and a few a neighbor, a few houses away one day, just really, I mean, I think it was almost like a small bomb went off and I just went berserk, you know, but I, I, did, I, I didn't go to the house, but I screamed like from my balcony. I said, that is not cool. <laughs> And you know what? And then, and then ate some mushrooms, and then. <laughs> I do, but you know what? It's all gone quiet up since then. It's gone really nice and quiet. So it it worked. It, uh, that was that was my most recent Viking moment. That is not cool. <laughs> Brilliant. I love that. That, that is, is not, that is cool. not cool. <laughs> That's a t-shirt. Viking fans, that is a t-shirt. It is. That is not cool. King oh, Linus, you're amazing. It's so great to see your face again. Yeah, it's great to see you guys too. Miss Thanks you. for doing this. Thanks for inviting me. It's wonderful. And good luck with the rest of it. I look forward to you know seeing them or Thank hearing you. them when they come out. Yeah, we love you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, Linus Roach, our Woo! Brett Walder of the show. He's king of all of England. He's king of all of us. King of all of Wessex. Amazing. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Great having you.